Welcome to this online broadcast by the National Institute for Health and Welfare on Coronavirus Vaccinations. I am Marko Lähtenmäki and we have Emma Kajander, specialized physician, and Hanna Novonek, chief physician, answering questions sent in advance by the viewers. Sandra Aaltonen and Pirjo Falk are responsible for interpreting sign language today. This broadcast will be made available afterwards in Swedish with subtitles on THL's YouTube channel and dubbed in English, Estonian, Arabic, Russian, Soron and Somali. We have gotten a lot of questions from you again, about 1000 of them. Thank you all for being active. Unfortunately, we do not have the time to answer them all, but Emma and Hannah's presentations are built in such a way as to answer as many of them as possible. And then the remaining time will be spent going through the individual questions. This time we again received a number of questions relating to your personal state of health. Unfortunately, we cannot answer any personal questions here at the Department of Health and Welfare. For these, it is advisable for you to contact the attending physician or your healthcare center directly. The municipalities are responsible for organizing the vaccination. So, from where, when and at what age in which municipalities are vaccinated, you should check these informations, for example, on the website of the municipality of residence. In summary, it is definitely worth taking the vaccine, which is voluntary and free of charge, and it's definitely worth taking, because vaccination is a very important part of containing this coronavirus epidemic and thus helps us to return to normal. Information on the pandemic can be found on the THL website at thl.fi slash coronarokote. But now let's proceed without further ado. Emma, you have the floor. Thank you, Marko. First, a brief overview of the coronavirus vaccination situation in Finland and a little about it in other parts of the world. In summary, there are now four different vaccine products in the European Union that have been authorized. And these first three are already in use here. And one vaccine is still waiting for our, our own instructions on how to proceed with this. Of these, two, BioNTech Pfizer's Cominati and Moderna vaccine, are these mRNAA vaccines very similar, given two doses with an approximate interval of 12 weeks and have a slight difference in the administration age limits. Otherwise, they are very similar vaccines. AstraZeneca's Vaxzevria vaccine is an adenovirus vector vaccine. It also has the same type of administration, but at the moment we have, in accordance with national guidelines, only given it to people aged 65 and over. This fourth vaccine, which is still awaiting our national guidelines, is also an adenovirus vector vaccine. It differs from all these other vaccines being a single dose vaccine. In the coming weeks, it will be decided how it will be used in Finland. Now that the holidays are approaching and people are planning to stay at the cottage, it is noticeable that people have a lot of questions about the administration interval. Our recommendation at the moment is this 12-week administration interval for, for all these vaccines, but it is certainly an approximation, so it's not quite day sensitive. And then if the 12-week interval has gone by already, the vaccine should be taken as soon as possible. It does not mean that you should start the whole process over from the beginning if you have not taken the second dose at the 12-week mark. What we now know about the optimal dose interval tells us that such a slightly longer interval in these vaccines is quite good to ensure the better kind of protection in the final stages. There are a lot of figures here and there they are rounded figures. I included these because this was also shown in the last citizens webinar and they present some indication of the amounts we are talking about. We are now in the second quarter, Q2, and we see that we are experiencing a strong increase in vaccine volumes. Pfizer's vaccine in particular comes in in very large quantities and several hundred thousand doses of vaccines arrive every week. This, of course, is also influenced by the way in which we use these vaccines. And now I have put the AstraZeneca in a kind of brackets. That is, now that we have an age limit of 65 years for the AstraZeneca vaccine, we no longer have that many people in Finland who are getting this vaccine. 
We already have enough vaccines in the country to cover the second doses for them, which means that we are not taking more of the AstraZeneca into the country at the moment. And here you can see how Finland has been vaccinating, and the fact is that vaccination has been a success in Finland. All vaccines that enter the country are also administered quite quickly, and the pace here has picked up. You can see the weekly variation here, and you can see that perhaps there is some indication that we have the opportunity to increase the pace every day. That is, uh, when there are more vaccines, there are plenty of vaccinators in Finland. Lähempänä noita huippupäiviä niin kuin joka päivä. Eli, eli kun tulee lisää rokotteita, niin Suomessa kyllä, kyllä antajia on ja niitä saadaan annettua. And that is why we now have a very good vaccination coverage. And in this side, uh, we see those who have received one dose in green and those who have received another dose in blue. And if we look at the uh, over 65 age group here, there is already a 70 to 90 percent vaccination coverage for the first dose. And then here in the middle aged group, the, the curve also rises very strongly. That is, this slide does look very nice. After all, our goal and the idea is that all those over the age of 16 who wish to be vaccinated should have received at least one dose by July at the latest. And this now looks likely and possible with these quantities of vaccines. When you look at European level, we look very good when you look at these vaccination coverages of the first dose. That is, the darker the color, the more people have received the first dose. I think Hungary shines very darkly there, but otherwise we are a star country. This, of course, uh, is due to what appears in this next slide, that we have had a strategy where we have a rather long uh, administration interval, and we have wanted to do just so, so that we can get as many people as possible vaccinated with the first dose as quickly as possible. And that is why we are now at the top of the EU's list. When you look at the second doses, that is where we are still lagging behind because of this strategy. But what is important here is that first we get the best possible protection for everyone here from the first dose, then we will be safer to give those second doses. That is, even if you look at Sweden, there is clearly lower and clearly different profile there regarding the amount of doses given. Of course, when you look at the global level, there are some of these countries that have a very high vaccination coverage, and I'm sure many people are familiar with that from the media. And then, of course, we have a lot of countries where vaccinations have hardly even started, which means that, unfortunately, the vaccines are distributed around the world very unevenly. Toki sitten kun katsotaan maailman tasolla, niin on näitä joitakin maita, joilla on erittäin korkea rokotuskattavuus, jotka on, on varmaan monelle tuttuja mediasta. Ja sitten toki meillä on paljon maita, missä ei juurikaan ole edes aloitettu rokotuksia. Eli hyvin epätasaisestihan tämä maailmalla valitettavasti jakautuu. The Finnish vaccination order has been planned based on medical grounds. Uh, it has uh, specifically been considered who is at risk of serious illness, hospitalization or even death, and then vaccinated in that order. In addition, the aim of this vaccination order is also to maintain the capacity of healthcare, because that is also a part of it, of course. If we do not have capacity in the healthcare facilities, then coronavirus deaths will also increase. And the vaccination order has been created with these issues in mind, covering now all those who wish to be vaccinated from the oldest people to the 16 year olds. Now we are at a good pace and we are vaccinating those who come after these risk groups at a slightly different pace in different municipalities. But there's variation in that. Uh, when one municipality can be on top today and then suddenly it is another one. Uh, it always depends a little. They kind of sprint out. There is currently some talk about the choice of vaccination products due to this age limit of 65 years, which has been set for AstraZeneca vaccine. I will go through the current situation, and it is one that lives as we learn more, and we can then make changes if necessary. 
But at the moment, when we are talking about people under the age of 65, if we are starting a new series of vaccines, then we always start with the mRNA vaccine, because we have discovered that the use of AstraZeneca involves, especially in younger people, the possibility of a very, very rare but a serious complication. We then have these people who have received the first dose of AstraZeneca vaccine already. They received it before the rare complication was discovered, and it has now been decided that the second dose of the vaccine given to them will be an mRNA vaccine, a different vaccine product. This is not our first-line choice. It is generally preferable to use the same vaccine product, but in this situation, when we are not uh, quite sure about the safety of this vaccine in people under the age of 65, we have felt that this is the best option of all, and at the moment, the case is that if a person under the age of 60, well, he cannot get an AstraZeneca vaccine even if they want to. Well then, for people aged 60 and over, the older vaccines can be used. So now, when starting a new vaccination series, it has been decided that the person will be able to choose what kind of vaccine he or she wants. But there, in the case of the second dose of vaccine, we strongly recommend taking the same vaccine as the first one, because it is the researched and best known way of vaccinating, and what the one uh, we also are best aware about the disadvantages. And of course, uh, sometimes it's necessary to deviate from this, give another product to people over the age of 65, but these are very rare cases, for example, if there has been some serious allergic reaction to that first dose. The third special group is the 16 to 17 year olds, who can only be vaccinated with Pfizer's Comirnaty vaccine, which is the only one that has authorization to be administered from the age of 16 onwards at the moment. That is, uh, so they are vaccinated only with it and not with the Moderna vaccine. Here was my introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. And let us then move to Hanna's speech. Hanna, please. Thank you and good evening to everyone who is indoors listening to this. I'm sure we would all rather be out there in the lovely sunshine and watching spring, but we'll be there soon. I have gathered here the questions you have sent us and we'll go through them. These are the, one, uh, the ones that were asked most frequently, but of course other questions will also be heard, but these are the ones that have been prepared in advance. So the uh, question is, can I get coronavirus even though I have taken the vaccination? And the answer is that you can, but the illness is usually milder or even asymptomatic. We are investigating these kinds of pass-through infections from the infectious diseases register. We can attach the infection data from the infectious diseases register. Uh, those are the PC confirmed coronavirus findings. And then the data from the vac vaccination register. And that is what we have done. And this latest information uh, from this very day is that there are a total of 1,278 such cases after 2.2 million doses of vaccine, which means that 0.06% of the vaccine doses administered became a so-called pass infection, the majority of which, 9 out of 10, were after the first dose of vaccine and then the 1 out of 10 after the second dose of vaccine. Of these more than 1,000, there were 78 people in inpatient care and 10 people in intensive care. And all of the rest were not hospitalized and we do not actually know that why then uh, this corona positivity was found. Whether uh, it was a finding found in uh, exposure situations or whether it was a finding found in accordance with the symptoms. All in all, uh, this gives you um, a view of the magnitude of how many such pass-through infections have been observed at their minimum. There are probably more, 
But the answer to the questioner is, is that you can actually get either coronavirus or get SARS coronavirus infection and that no vaccine is 100% effective. Then we have the question of how to protect others by taking the coronavirus vaccine. And this also implies the question of what it means to have herd immunity. And our answer is that you protect others when you do not infect yourself and develop the coronavirus. And you do not propagate the virus, and so the chain of infection does not happen as easily as opposed to being unvaccinated. Many different words are used for herd immunity. There's herd protection, there's population immunity, there's indirect immunity. And we also have other different uh, pathogens from the coronavirus where herd protection is seen. A good example is influenza. In case of the influenza, we try to vaccinate the, the closed circle because people who are very susceptible and fragile to influenza may not be able to form proper vaccine protection themselves. Measles is also a disease where very often people talk about herd immunity and it's breaking. Pneumococcal, it has been observed how the pneumococcal vaccine given to young children has prevented pneumococcal in older people and in fact almost eradicated it in Finland. And also there is the hemophilia B disease. These examples show how vaccination coverage prevents these chains of infection. So let's have a look at how it happens in practice. The example is made out of measles with a very big R0, which means that one infected person can infect 15 to 20 susceptible people in their surroundings. And you'll see that the vaccination coverage is 0% as it is up there on the left. And when the infection enters the community, it is going to spread like an explosion there. If vaccination coverage is 25%, then it's still quite strong, that spread. And when the vaccination coverage is 50%, there is spreading reasonably quickly there too. Only when you approach 75%, there will you see that the chains of infection will slow down. And when you reach that 90 uh, then there will be very few chains of, of infection. And then at 95, which is considered to be the limit of herd immunity, that the vaccination coverage for measles should be 95%, then you will see that the infection enters a community like this, uh, that the community is well vaccinated, and that the epi epidemic will not really get a foothold. And this applies, of course, to the coronavirus. It's R0 reading varies. It's not as at all as high as with measles. But the, the principle here is that what we are trying to achieve is to give as many people as possible the first dose at the moment so that we can achieve good coverage and thus control or even stop these chains of infection once we, we reach the vaccination coverage of about 70%, might be more. It depends on which variants we have here in the summer when that 70% coverage is achieved. Then there was a question of whether the vaccinated people could spread the coronavirus to others. And yes, it is the case that especially after the first dose of vaccination, the protection is not yet as high as it is after the second dose. Of course, even after one dose, it is clearly seen that fewer viral quantities are released and that the release is for a shorter period of time, but uh, sterile immunity is not achieved after one dose. After the second dose, we get much closer to it. But here I quote from Villeranda's excellent cartoon in which he points out that sterile immunity will not be achieved, at least not in the near future. And that is why we must stick to these precautions. Well, what if you miss your reinforcement vaccine for some reason? Does one vaccine pre provide enough protection? And to this, uh, perhaps I have already answered in parts. The second dose of vaccine is needed for the majority of coronavirus vaccines. This adenovirus vector vaccine from Janssen, also known as Johnson & Johnson, that one uh, is thought to provide good enough protection at a single dose, that it will at least do for the time being. But the majority of these vaccines that we have in use, they are thought to be two-dose vaccines. This means that after one dose, there is protection for a while, and it protects the recipient from serious forms of the disease in particular. But these asymptomatic infections are still possible and therefore you can spread that infection around you and so to ensure better and longer term protection you need that second dose. Regarding then the effectiveness of the vaccine, what it is according to the vaccine products and the severity of the disease and the doses administered and the country, here is a summary from the World Health Organization, WHO, 
Where in the left panel there, there is a symptomatic disease, uh, which means that the person is PCR positive and presenting clear corona symptoms, fever, breathing difficulties and so on. And you will see in it after the first dose and the second dose what the effectiveness of the vaccine is and what is the efficacy um, when it's visible uh, on that left bar going vertically from 0 to 100. And you can see the difference that after the first dose, the protection is reasonably good, but after the second dose, it clearly improves. This reflects the studies we have had on these different vaccine preparations. And then if we look at the protective efficacy of this vaccine against the serious form of the disease, you will see there too that after the first dose, the protection from a very serious disease is quite acceptable. But after the second dose, the protection will bounce up to almost 100%. So uh, as you see, there will be excellent vac vaccine protection. These, um, there are product uh, specific differences. There are also variant specific differences, which are not legible from this graph. And of course, all of these will affect the effectiveness of the vaccine in any country at any given moment. Well, then you asked uh, that if you have had COVID, is it worth taking the vaccine? And what we know is that the coronavirus disease provides protection that lasts from at least nine to 12 months. And the more serious the COVID uh, disease has been, the more protection there is, the higher the substances rise, the more cellular immu immunity there is. And this is especially important against serious forms of the disease. And the THL currently recommends that two doses of the vaccines are administered even after a person has had COVID. When we have more information, it may be that we will recommend that only one dose uh, be administered instead. But at the moment, we are giving two doses. But there's no terrible rush to take this vaccine as soon as you have recovered from the disease, because for a while you will be able to cope with that post-disease immunity. If then a person wants that vaccine immediately after recovering from the illness, then there is no obstacle to it. It's not dangerous in itself. There may be some more local symptoms and fever and muscle ache, as there are still many antibodies there that then react with the, with the vaccine. So life can become such a, a little stiff, but it's not dangerous, not in itself. Well, Next question is that if I take the vaccine, do I still have to comply with the restrictions? And the answer to that is yes. We will give separate instructions, hopefully as early as next week on uh, what two times vaccinated can or should not do. But at the moment, as we have the older population pro uh, protected, but younger adults who are specifically the ones with the most infections, who transmit infections to each other the most, then in these situations, we still hope that people wear masks, keep distances and recall that coronavirus is still among us. And therefore, even if vaccinated, these restrictions still apply. But more detailed instructions on what, for example, two people who have been fully vaccinated with two doses are allowed to do with each other or with the unvaccinated or with somebody who has been vaccinated once, we will provide more specific individual instructions. If someone close to me is afraid to take the vaccine, how can I encourage them to get it? There are a lot of people among us who are afraid of needles. And of course, there are different ways of discussing that. Or you can bring a friend to, with you to the vaccination site to hold your hands. And in the worst case scenario, give a sedative tablet before the vaccination in an extreme situation. But overall, if we consider this willingness to be vaccinated in Finland, then yes, it is high. But how many vac vaccination phobics are represented here, I don't, uh, I cannot say. But that the total willingness to be vaccinated, when we polled this at the end of April, you will see that depending on the age group, the older people being up here, and then you come down to the younger, you can see that uh, the older the person, the more willing they are to get the vaccine. And the younger they are, the more they hesitate. Well, then how much uh, fear of vaccination there is in this chart, I don't know. But it is worth talking about that fear of vaccination before you go to the place of vaccination. And it's worth seeing what you can uh, do uh, for yourself to live best with that fear. After all, the vaccination procedure in itself is very quick, but it is mainly the fear that you have before the vaccination when you are afraid of what will become of it. 
So one experience is there now as we have had time to vaccinate those who have received Zeneca with different booster vaccines. Have there been any collaterals? And uh, what we currently know from mix and match studies in the UK, where another um, vaccine has been administered after the Astra, is that there have been somewhat um, more uh, of a general nuisance like fever, fatigue, muscle pain, but they pass in a day or two. The figures are that uh, if about 12% developed a fever uh, after having received two doses of Astra, then now uh, it has risen to about 25% after taking first this AstraZeneca and an mRNA afterwards. We must be prepared for the possibility of some more local and general symptoms of this kind. Then what are the differences between vaccine manufacturers and the vaccines? So we have the mRNA vaccines in use. They are Biotech, Pfizer and Moderna. The Janssen vaccine will hopefully come to us in the summer as well. And in general, their protective effects will be observed about uh, 11 days after the first dose. And they present the possibility of a serious allergic reaction, which has been observed in about one case in 100,000. So it's very rare. The adenovirus vector vaccine's uh, protective effect begins somewhat slower and it remains higher for some time more than mRNA vaccines. And there have been these rare side effects of these uh, blood clotting disorders, abbreviated as TTS, or thrombotic thrombocytopenic syndrome. And they have been observed on one person in 100,000. And this is precisely the reason why we do not recommend this vaccine for people under 65 years of age. But on those over 65, there have been far fewer of these reactions and they, they also have their own risks due to COVID and the resulting coagulation disorders that are much greater than on younger people. Of course, there are other differences, for example, in the cold chains, the mRNA vaccines demand a more specific cold chain than the adenovirus vector vaccines, and we are still investigating the duration of the immunity given by these vaccines, time will show it, and studies are ongoing on these, as we also monitor these results from the registries here in Finland. Well, then there was the question of uh, if vaccines were to be developed against new coronavirus variants in the future, whether it will somehow depend on the brand of the vaccine I received in spring 2021, that I can get a vaccine later on against new variants or not. And this is a very good question to which we do not currently have a full answer because these variant vaccines which are being tailored and some of which will surely have been authorized before the end of the summer and then we will assess with the first round of vaccines and the second tailored booster how they should be administered collectively and it will probably be uh, that having received the mRNA vaccine in the first round then we will continue with the mRNA vaccine but there is a future possibility of combination vaccines especially uh, if the results regarding their immunogenic immunogenicity and efficacy are as we hope, then we may be able to start with Astra and continue with mRNA and then give a protein advance after that. These are all possible and different prospects for the future. Well, then you ask when this Johnson & Johnson or Janssen Corona vaccine will be introduced in Finland. And it does have a marketing authorization issued by the European Medicines Agency, EMA, and the European Medicines Agency reported last Friday on its adverse reactions. It also involves such uh, TTS, thrombos, uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenic blood clotting dis disorder. Not in as many cases as AstraZeneca, but very similar. And here we are supposed to outline next week how this vaccine fits in the vaccination toolbox of Finland and to whom it should be given. And there have also been questions about Sputnik as to whether it can be introduced to Finland. And we have a decision in principle that Finland will use vaccines approved by the EU Medicines Agency. The Sputnik vaccine is already in, uh, there to roll in the evaluation and it's going to be to get a marketing authorization from the European Medicines Agency. Then, of course, it can be considered, but uh, that at the moment is not a part of the joint vaccine portfolio of EU member states. 
Will it be there? It's still premature to say. Whether Finland wants to make a bilateral agreement on it, it's also premature to, stay and to say. And actually, in Finland, it is the Ministry of Social Affairs and Health that conducts these vaccination negotiations. So perhaps the Ministry of Social Affairs and Health will be able to answer this question. And then I think there was a final question as to whether the coronavirus vaccines will become, for example, a seasonal vaccine, such as the influenza vaccine. And this is one scenario. If uh, sars cov 2 is to continue as a highly disease-causing virus in the world, and especially if it forms different forms of co conversion viruses, which then can break the protection of the vaccine, then we are in a situation where every year or every two years a booster dose is needed. It is still premature to say what will happen, but we are preparing for the simultaneous issue of influenza vaccines and coronavirus vaccines if needed. That's all I had prepared, and now I'm sure we'll, we will, Marco, take some more questions that have come in and didn't find an answer in the previous presentations. Thank you both for the presentations. Indeed, let us continue with these more specific questions, uh, starting with a more general section that is firstly uh, the question of this coronavirus vaccine and tests, that is uh, whether it is worth taking a test if you have already had a flu vaccine but are still getting flu-like symptoms, and the follow-up question to whether the vaccination in itself can cause a coronavirus result. result. The vaccine does not give rise to a positive corona test result in the PC test. It doesn't have a live virus in it that can be seen in the PC test. In antibody tests, uh, you should be aware of what kind of vaccine uh, you have received. If you have received an inactivated virus vaccine, like the ones made by the Chinese Sinopharm, then antibody an analysis may not indicate whether it is a natural infection or whether it is an antibody reaction given by the vaccine. So in terms of tests, the PCR test will not be confused or it will not confuse natural disease and the administrated vaccine. Then if you have received one dose of the vaccine, as it was said earlier, then you may become a completely asymptomatic or even a symptomatic carrier of the viral infection. And if there is reason to believe that there is a coronavirus, uh, then it's worth taking the tests. And just an addition to this, uh, these vaccina vaccination reactions, which occur just after vaccination, are quite similar in many respects to the disease. So if there are very typical symptoms of a vaccination reaction immediately after vaccination, then you do not have to go to the test right away but if the fever persists for more than three days, or if there are symptoms such as loss of sense of smell or taste that are not typically related to the vaccination, then you should take the test immediately. Thank you. Let's, let's continue with the ingredients contained in the corona vaccine. Uh, for instance, if a person follows a special diet, for example, vegan or halal, then can the vaccination be taken? Yes, these coronavirus vaccines used by us are all halal and kosher, and they are also suitable for vegans. So you don't, don't have to think about which one would fit you. They're all just as good. Good. Well, of course, the safety of coronavirus vaccines is still a hot topic, as you have already commented in the presentations. So just a small specific question of this kind, that is, uh, what is known so far for example, about the long-term adverse effects of the mRNA vaccines, and if not yet known, how will these be investigated? Well, long-term side effects are rare. The majority of vaccine harm comes during the first six weeks after vaccination. Rare future complications, of course, they are monitored in Finland. We have a monitoring system based on register-based analysis, which means that we can combine these Hilmo clusters or outpatient registers and the vaccination register of the hospital quite individually by combining them. And then, and then see if certain 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 diseases have appeared in vaccinated people vaccinated. more than in the unvaccinated. And in this way, we can find signals there. But such serious side effects after a long time are very, very rare. Well, then there's a question of coronavirus vaccines and pregnancy. 
Is it safe to take a coronavirus uh, vaccine when pregnant? And can the vaccine harm the fetus? Or can non-vaccination be more dangerous? Well, what we know is that pregnancy, especially in the second trimester and the third trimester, when comparing uh, pregnant women with non-pregnant women of the same age, then there is a somewhat increased risk of a more serious coronavirus and also a risk for the child. Then, and from this point of view, it has been taken that if a pregnant woman has medical reasons, she has some basic disease that would make the coronavirus dangerous for her in addition to pregnancy, then it will be possible to discuss with her whether it would make sense for her to take the corona vaccine, to think about the benefits and disadvantages, and then most often in such situation, vaccination will be administered. In these efficacy studies, uh, which form the basis of this marketing authorization, pregnant women were not included among the studies, and all this information on the effectiveness of vaccination and the safety of vaccination in pregnant women is always accumulated here through a follow-up study, and an important role is played here by the United Kingdom and the United States, where pregnant women have been vaccinated the most with both AstraZeneca vaccine and mRNA vaccine. And what we know so far about these women whose pregnancy has ended up either in childbirth or then in, in fetal loss, is that uh, there has been no abnormal safety signal that tells us what ha that what happened is due to vaccination. And so these expectations of how many are born alive and healthy and how many premature births or low weights have been exactly the same for vaccinated and unvaccinated people. Well, what if you're just planning to become pregnant? Can you take the vaccine and are there any protection time recommendations? Well, here too, we have taken the view that if you have the wish to conceive and you have different treatments on, you don't have to stop the treatments while you're vaccinating. What we know from animal studies and cell tests is that these vaccines that we use do not involve any findings suggestive of fetal malformations, which means that from that point of view, it is safe to conceive even at the, uh, at the time of vaccination. But... Um, this being the case, we are recommending that no precaution periods should be taken between vaccination and pregnancy. Well, while well, everyone is still hesitant or unsure about the safety of vaccines, what would you recommend as a reliable source of vaccination information in addition to the THL's own website? Well, a lot of our sister institutions have good information. There is a lot of good information on the Public Health England page of the UK sister institution and, of course, medical literature. Just over a week ago, there was a review of the corona risks of pregnant women in the Journal of American Medical Association. And then the New England Journal published a week and a half ago about the safety of vaccination in pregnant women. So, of course, there are such medical publications and the pages of sister institutions that are then worth turning to. Of course, uh, it requires that you speak English, but we also try uh, to bring out the most important things to our own website. So you should also be able to find these things in a general format in Finnish and in Swedish. Thank you. Then let's move on to the issues of vaccination progression and vaccination intervals. Let us start with this targeting of vaccinations. What do we know about it at the moment? On what principle is it done in Finland? Uh, yes, that is, um, it became a government decree that this targeting will now be introduced for the duration of May. And it means that it will always be checked at the end of the week whether there is a region in Finland where this corona incidence would have been above a certain limit. And if so, certain vaccines will be targeted to this region or to these areas. Then there are very specific plans as to how they will be distributed if there are more than one of these areas. For practical reasons, these apply only to Moderna vac uh, vaccine. According to the regulation, AstraZeneca's vaccine would also apply, but at the moment we do not have such a need for the AstraZeneca, so only those Moderna doses that are left over after it has been considered where exactly the second doses are needed are allocated. This has now been done once, which means that last week there was one region in Finland, Ayathame, where the incidence was above this threshold. And now this week more vaccines have been targeted there than elsewhere. 
Thank you. And let's continue with this period between vaccinations. You mentioned in the presentations that it does not matter if the vaccination interval is slightly longer than the 12 weeks, but could it be shorter if the situation was so good that more vaccines were available? Well, what we know based on immune, immunological principles is that you shouldn't keep a too, long, too short a vaccination interval. This applies both to mRNA vaccines and to the adenovirus vector vac vaccines, uh, that it is known uh, that the marketing authorization has been given for the RNA vaccines for three to four weeks. But that is because uh, when there was a rush to carry out those studies at the beginning of the pandemic, the drug manufacturer did not have the opportunity to test different intervals. But what we are currently aware of based on antibody analysis and how they translate into the effectiveness of the vaccine in practice, the, that this longer interval is better. Of course, then if, if it is a question of being in a very difficult epidemic situation where there's a lot of virus in traffic, and especially if the viruses are then conversion viruses for which vaccines do not provide good uh, enough protection, then of course it is different. But in principle, it is better to vaccinate the second dose further away from these three weeks than closer to it. Then, what do we know about vaccination of children? After all, it is now the case that only the over 16s are vaccinated with these vaccines as per the licenses. So, do we have any preconceptions as uh, how to proceed with the vaccination of children? In fact, uh, the preconception is that uh, Biotech Pfizer's vac vaccine has been authorized by the American FDA yesterday, and a group of vaccination experts in the US will hold a meeting tomorrow that is open to all the world. So if you have uh, no program for tomorrow night, then from 6 p.m. on, you can see how U.S. colleagues discuss to which 12 to 15 year olds the vaccine should be given. The European Medicines Agency will make its decisions in June. When exactly in June, we do not know. But then there will be a policy in Finland and we have already prepared ourselves for it so that we have a subgroup for the vaccination of children, which will then consider what the burden of disease is in children and what is also the willingness of parents to vaccinate children and how effective and safe it is. And then a recommendation for Finland will be made with basis on this research. We know that between 12 and 15 years of age, the, the, the antibodies are even better than those of young adults, so that any vaccines are very effective on this age group. Well, we have also received a lot of questions about vaccination of non-citizens. So what, it, what is the practice of uh, whether a foreign citizen who works or studies in Finland uh, can receive a vaccine from Finland, and if so, where? Yes, yes, they can. That is, it's in all our interest that as many people as possible who are here with us receive the vaccine and this has also been agreed with the EU. This does not apply to a very occasional tourists and of course there are not many of those now, but if you are, as it were, a long-term or even a permanent resident of Finland, you can get a vaccine here from the municipality where you reside. Thank you. Täällä Suomessa niin, niin voi saada täältä, täältä rokotteen sieltä kunnasta, jossa, jossa oleskelee. Thank you. Well then, a little more focus on this vaccine from AstraZeneca. We also have a lot of people who would like to get the, the vaccine faster than it is their turn. Is it possible to get the AstraZeneca vaccine if you are under 65 years old and you want to get it? Well, these are the very issues that are to be discussed this week. It is also a question of legal matters. If we have a national recommendation that that vaccine can only be given to those 65 years uh, old and older, but not younger, then whether such a person who takes it at their own will is covered by medical insurance, those are the issues we need to clarify so that we can then give reliable guidance that, uh, so that there will be no surprises. So that is precisely why we now have that guideline that was previously discussed, that people under the age of 65 are not allowed to choose their own vaccine. But I would stress that this is the current guideline and that uh, when more information is available, it may change. Yes, 
Good. Well, uh, that protective efficacy was talked about uh, in in that uh, Hannah's presentation. But can you specify, Hanna, how this protective efficacy of vaccines is defined? That is, when it is said that the protective efficacy of the vaccine is 90%, what does it actually mean? Yes, I, I should have brought that algorithm with me again last time we went through it. So, the effectiveness of the vaccine is calculated so that it, it is 1 minus the risk ratio and it is multiplied by 100 and put a percentage mark after it. And risk ratio means how much of that preventable disease occurs in vaccinated people compared with the unvaccinated. And this gives the ratio then. That is, uh, it's a ratio of the appearance of the disease in vaccinated versus unvaccinated people. That is what it means. And it's worth drawing for yourself to understand that one minus the risk ratio. And then if the incidence is, for example, 10 times that of the unvaccinated versus vaccinated people, then you will understand what it consists of. Next time, next time I can bring it again and draw it. This is a rather difficult thing for an ordinary person to understand, but the explanation was good. Then we're going to twist things around a little bit. So, if it happens that we found out about a probable coronavirus infection after the first dose of vaccine, then do we have to go and get the other dose? Well, according to our current guidelines, yes, get the second dose. But as Hanna said earlier, it may be that at some point we will give up on this when we have enough information on how well such a combination protects disease and vaccine. But uh, here it's the same thing as uh, when you would have been ill before that first dose. That There is no rush. Uh, this um, the, the illness can prolong the immunity and then you can take the second dose later, even months later. Good. Uh, well, what does the future of vaccine production look like? That is, do you have any estimates to as to whether there will be a shortage of the vaccines in the future, or will vaccine production cover the need? Well, at the moment, the World Health Organization has estimated that almost uh, 8 billion people around the world would have been vaccinated by the beginning of 2024. And this depends on many if issues, like if production capacity is increased, and if the virus does not change too much, and so on. So uh, yes, we are all dealing with the fundamental questions that when we started to vaccinate against the coronavirus, all countries were of the opinion that global equality is important here, that all countries should receive vaccines. But as we have seen, there are still countries in Africa where coronavirus vaccination has not even begun and they are depending on donation. 43 countries have only one vaccine in use and only a few percent of the population have been vaccinated. So there is quite a lot more to be done before we are at the point where the entire population of the world would have received the vaccine. And especially if we observe a need for booster doses every year or every two years, then that means we have to increase our vaccine and production capacity. There has been a lot of debates about whether licenses should be released, that this relaxation of IP rights is important, but it's um, just a single tile in this big picture where factory construction and quality assurance are needed and, 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 and also the erection of a cold chain that has a large capacity uh, has to be built. Good. Well, let's move on to the last topic, coronal vaccination certificates. What do we know about this development at the moment? Well, the implementation of this coronavirus vaccination certificate is currently underway and it will be implemented in Finland for, um, for the Omakanta service. So um, it will be available here in the omakanta.fi where you can also check your other personal health information. There will now be a national certificate available at the end of this month and then during July a common EU-level coronavirus certificate. 
So this is kind of a certifier of the fact that the person has been vaccinated. Then this uh, European Union certificate uh, also comes with these options that it can also be a certificate uh, that you have suffered from the disease or a certificate that you have recently been tested. And of course, the certificate is free of charge on Kanta Pistefi. And from there, it can either be printed or displayed from your own telephone when necessary. Now, this will come into use in May um, or in June, and it will be uh, a while before all of you who have already been vaccinated can see this vaccination form um, there immediately. So it's not worth worrying straight away that there's some mistake. Uh, just wait patiently and the, the certificates will be visible there. Of course, it's a little unclear also what it's used for, uh, because now there is still no defined actual use for this national certificate. And then this European Union level certificate is to be used, for example, for travel. But even then, every country decides for itself what kind of criteria they have for entry. But we will learn more about it over the summer. So we can all be patient. Those certificates will get there. We, they do not uh, need to be printed right away when they get there. Uh, technical progress is being made all the time. Yes. Is there anything else you can think of at this point, what you would like to raise for the audience? Well, everybody out there, what you have to do is keep it up. Remember that it's not over yet. And even if you have had one or two doses of the vaccine, you still need to hang on a little bit. That was a good crystallized finish. Before we finish, I would like to remind you that we will continue this series of Corona vaccination webinars, which means that the next public event will be on May 27th. It will also be a Thursday and the time will be the same time at 5.30 p.m. Thank you all, the, the viewers, and we wish you a pleasant continuation of this summer evening.